Well, yes, indeed, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Isaac Salako here with us, Minister of State for Environment. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Well, I know the key part of, of that report is when you were highlighting the policy about this uh, single-use plastics. It, it actually got several people thinking, what is government's approach? I mean, how is this going to work if, if you say you want to lead by example? Is it the right approach, the right steps to take? So give us that background now. What kind of considerations went into this before you came up with this announcement? Um, once again, thank you for having me. Um, I think that we all realize that um, solid waste, particularly those generated from our domestic activities, is a major challenge for us in Nigeria. If you, our streets are littered, our drains are clogged, our markets are dirty, essentially from domestic solid waste. And if you do an analysis, you see that plastic also forms a major part of that. If you also look at the life cycle of waste management, one key aspect of it is reduction in the amount of waste you generate. And reducing means that you then have to look at all the kinds of waste we generate, and those you think there are alternatives that can be eliminated, you eliminate them. Again, I must also let you know that there's already a global movement which is going to come up with a treaty in 2025 to enforce the way we use and produce plastics. And Nigeria has been part of that negotiation. So we must start preparing at our country level in terms of taking a second look on the way we currently so, use plastic. So what do we have in place to ensure that this decision stands? Now, you see that uh, what we have started, we have started in a very gradual manner. Um, I don't know whether you are aware that uh, in January this year, we piloted this ban within the Federal Ministry of Environment, all departments, all agencies, of the Federal Ministry of Environment. And today, if you come to the Federal Ministry of Environment, you do not see us using single-use plastics again. We have procured water dispensers for our people. We have encouraged people to get water bottles. Those we can give water bottles to, we did. So that everybody can bring water from home or fresh water from water dispensers. So that that is a ready, a ready alternative. And a lot of people are already practicing it. Uh, if you go to the UN headquarters in Nigeria today, They've been doing this for years. So it's not as if something that is not possible. So we've decided to start from the Federal Ministry of Environment. Now we've scaled up to all federal uh, MDAs. We're hoping that we can also engage the state levels. They also scale up to all uh, state ministries and agencies. And by the time you look at that population, it's going to be significant. Those are going to form a nucleus of champions in our country. Whereas I'm not saying that uh, in January next year, we're going to ban single-use plastic, but we must start preparing our mind for that. Mm. And we feel that starting from that level is a very good way to test run it, to learn it, and then to see what areas that we need to readjust to it. I'm glad that, to be very honest, when I heard it, I thought it was, this is rather bold. Um, <laughs> and I'm really very, very curious as to, you know, how this is going to be implemented. I'll be very honest with you. I pray that it succeeds. Uh, and I wish you the very best. I'm, I'm glad that you are championing this and you say that you've already started in the Ministry of Environment. Uh, you've given examples of other international agencies that are using it. But I know for certain that right now we, are, we have a problem. In a country where, as you've just mentioned, portable water is a major issue. There are no taps that people can just go to and drink as we see in many other places. So even when, as you have encouraged your members of staff to drink from the dispenser or to bring water from home, um, it can be a bit difficult or tricky when you have visitors. Uh, so in that sort of situation, what, uh, what are you looking at and how do you think this is going to happen for ministries, departments and agencies who are always organizing programs and will need to, you know, at least make water available in those programs, even if they do not give you know, uh, how will I put it now, bottled water. If they put a dispenser there, there will still be cups that, be, that must be used. And oftentimes, these cups are made out of plastic. 
Well, I, I'm sure that if you engage your environmental correspondents who have been attending our programs, um, she'll be able to tell you that uh, in, in our programs at the Federal Ministry of Environment, since about February or March this year, we no longer serve water bot uh, uh, bottled water. We bring our water dispensers, we provide paper cups, and our staff comes with their water bottles to fresh water to drink. So I believe that, yes, it's not going to be um, an easy thing that we just snap our finger and, and then it's, it's, it's working. But it is something that we need to do. And there are alternatives all over the place. Now there are biodegradable plastics. And then that is also, we create opportunity for investment in that area. You know, then bottle, uh, water is also being packaged in bottles. You know, those are alternatives that we can also continuously um, evaluate and look at how to take advantage of it. So I believe that, uh, generally speaking, we need to start. And like, just like it's, it's a journey of a thousand years, start with one step. Once we start like this, we gradually, and what we have just done is not to start in a scale that will overwhelm us. So we have started small and gradually we're uh, upscaling it. And I believe that if you look at the population of civil servants in Nigeria, for example, federal civil servants are about 700,000. If you add that to state civil servants, if, when they come on board with us, at the end of the day, you're having about 1.5 million Nigerians who are persuaded and who are doing this. Even if it's half of them that are doing this, they, 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 they are a champion for it. In my house, as an example, as a result of the decision at the ministry level, I had to also do tell it to my my house, and I no longer use single-use plastic. But, but, in my but house. we don't know if those 700,000 do the same thing in their houses. Yes, I in so the offices, I, maybe. I said that maybe if it's half of them that is doing it, <laughs> okay. it's still something significant that we can continue to push. Mm -hmm. And gradually, we can um, uh, focus and uh, elevate and scale up mm -hmm. on the implementation of this kind of thing. Well, I, I believe it's, a thing, it's something we need to do. Indeed, the awareness, uh, the fact that the awareness alone is, you know, is coming from government and government is willing to lead by example on this particular instance might challenge many people to look inwards and see how it is that they, they too can reduce that. Uh, but would you be also implementing, and much later, first and foremost, I want to know if there's a start date for this. It, it was it with the immediate effect, what was decided at FEC for the mini for ministries, departments and agencies? I think that we still need a few weeks to... Gets because first we need to um, circulate the framework for implementation. Um, since with the policy, uh, the pronouncement from FEC, a lot of people have approved, how do we go about this? How are we going to implement this? So I've decided to now do a, uh, an implementation framework to advise MDAs on how they're going to go about it. So that will take a few weeks to do. And once we're able to do that, we will then come out and uh, announce the stats of the implementation. When will the ban effectively take, when, at what point, you know, when precisely do you think this ban will take effect? Because when people hear an announcement, they always think that it has taken immediate no, no, it's effect. Not. It doesn't take immediate so, Usually, ESCO decisions like this, um, first the, um, the SGF has to circulate, a circular around the MDAs. Uh, the announcement on uh, TV is not enough. For, um, uh, so the circular must be circulated, and again, we are going to do a framework. So I envisage that within the next four weeks, max, we should be able to mm. start the implementation. Mm. So, yeah, I'm wondering, what is the FG strategy to communicate this or ensure that um, those who actually sell products with all of these plastics get the memo and comply? Well, the memo for now is targeted at civil servants and it's restricted within the offices, you know. So the memo is going to be circulated to all MDAs. We're going to advise them how to go about it in terms of what kind of structure they need to put in place and then what kind of infrastructure they need to provide to support the implementation of that policy. So that is the way it's going to be for now. So at the end of the day, since it's not a nationwide ban, uh, we were, we're going to be doing sensitization and uh, preparing the minds of Nigeria. Well, eventually. Eventually, something will come. Okay, mm. something so will come. Are you also yeah. beginning to prepare the minds of companies? Mm -hmm. That so this is something, I mean, we are already starting this. This is something that could eventually, uh, you know, take place. And maybe that day too should start exploring the alternatives. Absolutely. So it doesn't hit them all of a sudden. Absolutely, absolutely. I can tell you that there has been continuous engagement, even before I became minister over this. Um, 
for as an example, those um, who use pet bottles, particularly big manufacturers of uh, uh, drinks, uh, soda drinks, they have an association and they engage on a continuous basis with us. This has started for a while. And then now we're also trying to bring in the small producers because we realize that when you aggregate the small producers together, they are actually outnumbered in terms of their capacity, the number they produce, they outnumber the large producers. So we're also trying to aggregate the small producers, all those small, small producers of uh, sachet and uh, water bottles, aggregate them at state and local government levels so that we can also put them in an association and engage them. So there will be that level of engagement on a continuous basis so that everybody is carried along. Mm -hmm. And we all agree that gradually we need to um, gradually transit from full use of uh, uh, single-use plastic to other alternatives. While we're doing that, there needs to be an alternative for people to be able to, you know, get water, especially in public places, uh, for trips, for journeys, etc. Et uh, is this something also that you, perhaps you're collaborating with the Ministry of Water Resources? I know that they, they usually manage dams, etc., and their, their job is more big scale, but uh, is it something that you are also impressing upon the Federal Executive Council that this has to be a priority. Yeah, absolutely, because um, uh, provision of water is a very essential element of, uh, of governance, you know. Uh, it's not only with respect to pollution, even with respect to sanitation and some of the challenges around public health issues, water is central. So it's something that we continue to also engage the water resources. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that for us and the uh, Minister of Water Resources, we work very closely, um, like service trees, you know. They, they do the sanitation part, but we do the enforcement of that sanitation, you know. So there's a lot of collaboration between us to ensure that we work together. So certainly for this uh, policy to have the desired effect, we must also scale up our provision of water at the public taps for our people. Definitely it's an essential need. Why did we decide this? Up? Because I, I saw a study... I included countries like Ireland and some of the other countries. So what they did was they introduced some sort of taxation and then they said they saw a significant decrease in people who use or the use, the general use, countrywide of this single-use plastic. So why did we choose this approach rather than their own approach? Well, there's really no one approach to address this issue, uh, you know. Um, and uh, for us in Nigeria, it's just not going to be an approach of time. Uh, we're also doing an approach of um, um, a kind of uh, 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 deposit scheme where you can uh, bring back uh, waste. Like recycling? Uh, kind of uh, put it into the recycling system. So it's going to be a, a, a circular thing. And that is why, if you recall, recently we launched the circular roadmap, economic roadmap for Nigeria. And we're talking about that waste management. We talked about the issue of reduction, which is... Uh, the ban addresses. We usually talk about the issue of repurposing, making them use for other things, and then the issue of recycling. It also comes. So it's a circular thing. So it's not going to be a one lane approach. We have other approaches. Yes. Um, for example, we were also thinking of introducing some kind of preferential pricing. You know, when you return, you pay less. When you don't return, you pay more. That's some kind of taxation, too, in a way. So all, all this takes time because they need legislation, you know, mm. and then they need the full buying of the subnational government. For why, it to be why would you say it's been very difficult for us to, you know, go full scale on recycling? Uh, it, our recycling system is not, our models are not exactly the most ideal. I mean, it's not like what we see elsewhere. Yes, we recycle. In some instances, the people recycle plastics. You find children going to go and pick these plastics uh, in many ways that are unhygienic. People have already put them in the dustbin and you find, you know, people who are going to go and, I'm trying to remember the names we use for them now. Pickers. Yeah, who just go to go and look for this. But it's not ideal. Uh, why do you think that implementing policies around recycling has been very difficult? Well, I, well there is multifactorial, really. First is that, um, you, you know, the Constitution of Nigeria puts squarely at the doorstep of local governments for the management of domestic wastes, you know. And if you look at the capacity of our local governments in recent times, you know that those capacities are not optimal. So they may not be able to effectively, and you find out that in a, few, in a lot of states now, the management of domestic wastes has mostly been taken over by state governments, sometimes in collaboration with the local government. 
So what we need to do is to reject the, 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 the thinking around it. First is that uh, we need to create a system where um, you don't necessarily have to drop your waste before it is made use of. You know, we have to uh, create a system where uh, if there's a, return, a, a, a reverse logistic pathway, for example, so that as the protocol goes to the end, end users, there's also a pathway also created that can bring the waste generated from those products back to people who can use it without a break in the chain. So that also is something that we can do. Of course, it also requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of thinking, and it requires a lot of collaboration, not only with the government, even the private sector, with individuals, you know, for this to be able to, to be effective. So we're working very hard also in this direction to be able to ensure that. And all these things also require some regulatory uh, framework, some legislation to back it, because if you do not create uh, legislation that provides for enforcement, that also provides for reward and sanctions, most of the time, it doesn't have the optimal uh, uh, effect. Honorable Minister, thank you. Uh, it's good to see you again. I mean, all of, the, all of the conversation that we're having is quite interesting. But allow me to take you on a slightly different tangent this morning. We've had conversations with some specialists, including uh, head of an environmental protection agency in Lagos, who says, particularly concerning the current issue of cholera making the rounds, that uh, it's not just a health emergency, but an environmental emergency as well. And uh, part of what he also helped us to understand is that even though we talk about curative medicine, we should also be talking about preventive medicine. And that to a large extent, preventive medicine is more about the environment because uh, the, uh, such an, a situation as cholera, this cholera outbreak, for instance, could have been taken better care of if the environment was well protected. What's your take on that? Well, absolutely, um, he is right. Um, we cannot um, have any desired impact in reducing the um, prevalence of diseases like cholera in our environment, in our country, except we will scale up our ability to maintain environmental sanitation and also personal hygiene, you know. So you find out that uh, cholera as a disease is largely driven by poor sanitation, poor personal hygiene. And until we do that, we cannot break that chain of transmission. And that is why you see that the Federal Ministry of Environment is also very involved in addressing the current outbreak. If you uh, recall, the cabinet uh, committee that Mr. President set up, uh, the Federal Ministry of Environment is represented. The emergency operations center that is being operated at the national level by the NCDC, the Federal Ministry of Environment, is part of it. And at the state level too, state ministries of environment are part of it. So we need definitely to scale up our level of sanitation, provision of portable water, uh, improvement in personal hygiene, if we are going to have any uh, desired effect in diseases like cholera, including other waterborne and sanitation-driven diseases, gastroenteritis, um, uh, meningitis, and so on and so forth, polio, so all kinds of diseases like that. Mm. Well, you know, in, in that same light, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, there are those who would wonder, we knew that this was going to happen. The DG of the NCDC made that clear that this is not something we are hearing for the first time. We knew it would happen. It happens every year. What are the things that we could have done to prevent it? Because essentially we are talking about preventive medicine here. It would seem like indeed we have abandoned preventive medicine for curative medicine. Well, uh, first let me say that uh, cholera is a disease that um, we may not easily be able to eliminate from our society. Because even if you go to very, some other advanced countries, uh, in this current outbreak, outbreak is even being reported in some parts of Europe, you know. So it is not a disease that we may be able to eliminate. But clearly, we can reduce the prevalence, and more importantly, we can also reduce the case fatality. So that even when people suffer from cholera, they don't necessarily have to die from it. And to be able to do that requires first the sanitation bit in terms of ensuring that, and first the surveillance activities must be top notch. Because when we have top notch surveillance activities, we're able to catch the outbreak very early and we're able to detect the source 
of the infection and then break the transmission. That is the first thing. Then, of course, the, 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 the environment that propagates it, which is the sanitation and personal hygiene breach, we need to definitely improve on that. And, of course, our health system also needs to be more elaborate and more responsive so that even when people get um, cholera, there are facilities that can easily and quickly attend to them so that they don't necessarily have to die from that. So you see that what we need is a multi-sectorial collaboration to ensure that we do that. The environment doing its part, water resources doing its part, um, health and social services doing its part, and of course the media too, also helping us to propagate the message to ensure that our people's awareness is increased. So who then would should be taking the lead here? There is a, definitely a job for the Ministry of uh, the environment, as you said. But then there are those who would wonder what are the local governments doing, what are the state governments doing? Who should be taking the lead here? Because it would seem like no, no one is doing anybody's work. No, no, uh, the Minister of Health is the lead agency for the response to cholera outbreak because it is first a health issue. And in that response, the environment is involved um, uh, um, water resources is involved, education in our current outbreak, we have also involved the education system because our children are in school. We have involved the aviation because of people who may move from one country to the other, you know, because it's a global outbreak at the moment, so and so on and so on. So it depends on the context of the outbreak that's also bringing, but most of the time you find out that, as in the current outbreak, the Minister of Health is leading. At the local government and state level, same thing is also replicated. And you find out that at the local government level especially, environmental health officers are also there. And those environmental health officers are most essentially uh, 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 regulated by the Ministry of Environment. So through the regulatory mechanism of the Ministry of Environment, we're also able to deploy the environmental health officers, support their activities in terms of advisories and materials as they need be. So, at the end of the day, it's a much sectoral thing, but the Federal Minister of Health is uh, the leading agency in the response. All right, and well done to you and your team, Dr. Isaac Salako, Minister of State for Environment. Thank you for coming on this morning. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. All right, that wraps it up uh, today on the program. We also thank you all for watching. We'll see you next time. I'm Train Balloner, so have yourselves a very good weekend. Well, we hope that we've also challenged you to consider the use of single-use plastic in your <laughs> homes. See how it is that you can u reuse and recycle. Thank you for watching. I'm Mao Pelgun Yusuf. I hear there is a um, wave going around now. Alternative tomatoes. I don't know if anyone is trying that this weekend. Amaya Makinde, have a wonderful rest of your weekend.